have an annual theme for this year, and it kind of got sidetracked with my uh, health situation, but uh, nonetheless, it is living in the favor of God. How many of you are living in the favor of God today? Wow. I thought there would be more. <laughs> living in the favor of God. Now, in the New Testament, as we are, uh, we would call it living in the grace of God. How many of you are living in the grace of God? Okay, very good, very good. I'm thankful for God's divine favor. Kenyon wrote the book, Favor the Road to Success. It is the road to true success, not in terms of what the world considers to be success, but rather to be in the will of God, in the purpose of God, in the plan of God, and to receive the blessing of God because you are there in that place, in right relationship with him, following him, believing him, obeying him. And so we continue this series as we're going through characters of the Old Testament, and we begin today in the life of Abraham. And of course, in these entry chapters of the story of the life of Abraham, he is referred to as Abram. Living in the favor of God, the life of Abraham. Number one, the life of Abraham is a life of faith, and obedience. If you say that you have faith, but you do not have obedience, you do not have faith. Faith without works is dead, being alone. Even the devils believe and tremble. And so, yes, faith pleases God. It's the only thing that pleases God. But where there is faith, there will always, say always, always produce obedience. How many of you like it when your children and grandchildren are obedient? That's when the candy starts flowing. That's when the gifts get bigger and better and... Uh, of course, when Brooklyn came along, our first grandchild, uh, I would tell her from time to time at the anguish of the parents, I would tell her, Brooklyn, is there anything that you do not have that you would like to have? <laughs> it's called favor. And we want to bless our children. We want to bless our grandchildren and on. And so we live in this situation where we love them regardless of what they do. Terrible twos and beyond. We love them regardless, unconditionally. But how wonderful it is to watch them grow and through the years and become increasingly obedient to the things of God and to mature just in an, in an earthly sense, to watch their development and their growth is very exciting. But to know that we can bless them and, and appreciate them and compliment them, edify them, build them up. Don't provoke your children to wrath. But build them up, and because you're for laying a great foundation, you have them in the house of God, you demonstrate the life of Christ at home, you pray and you seek the face of God, you teach them God's word. And so what a great start that is for our children. And so we just want to lavish favor upon them. Personally speaking, I don't think there's a pastor in America who's been treated better than I have. Uh, your kindness and your grace toward me has been extraordinary through the decades. And, and I am so grateful for that favor that you've shown and demonstrated to uh, myself, my wife, and my children and grandchildren. It, it is an extraordinary thing, this thing called the family of God. I, I hear people all the time tearing down the church at large. The church is this, the church isn't that, the church is this, and, and on and on and on these things. And I can't relate to it. Because we're here in a family of God that is extraordinary in so many ways. You love God, you worship God, you sing like a choir when you're in worship. <laughs> you, you give to missions, you support the church in tithes and offerings, you bless us in every step of the way, in good times and bad, you have been there. And so I feel extremely favored. And to think that uh, God has extended my life in the way that he has miraculously, uh, I have to give God all the honor, praise, and glory for that because he has extended to me favor. 
I've been young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. And so I, I receive the favor of God. God is for us, not against us. He blesses us. He's a good God. And, and I get somewhat irritated, and, and I hear it so frequently out there in the world today. How could a loving God do this or that? How could a loving God uh, allow this thing, this bad thing to happen? I want to tell you that as we say it all the time, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Thank God for the goodness of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, uh, His presence that goes with us at all times. Thank God He is for us. He puts His grace and favor upon our lives at all times. How many of you are thankful for the favor, the favor of God? When I was much younger, we'd sing songs in church like, I am blessed. I am blessed. Every day that I live, I'm blessed. Wake up in the morning, lay my head to rest. I am blessed. I am blessed. Or another one, we don't deserve it, but yes, we are blessed. Got health, clothing, clothing and strength. We are blessed. We don't deserve it, and yet we are blessed. One more. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. Thank God for his divine favor. Now, you well know that I was my mother's favorite child. I was her only child, but favored, favored. Some people think that she spoiled me. I disagree totally with that, but it is a wonderful thing to know that you're loved, that you're cared for, and uh, to know that kind of favor is wonderful, but it does not compare to the favor of God resting upon your life. True success in life is to know the grace of God, to know the favor of God, and to find all of his benefits. So bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Thank God for the blessing of God that rests upon us today. How many of you feel blessed? Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord said unto Abraham, notice that God is speaking. Some people doubt from time to time whether God speaks to man. I'm telling you that God speaks to man. Old Testament, New Testament, in the modern age, God speaks to man. The Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country... And from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. We'll find out later what spiritual condition Abraham, Abram was in the beginning. Uh, he who would have worshipped many gods, polytheistic. Now here's the voice of the one true God. And so God speaks to him in this fashion. You were talking about uh, getting married and all the transition of your life and missions. And uh, I kind of look back to the years when uh, my wife married me in August. And in September, we moved to Leota, Kansas, on the other end of the state. And uh, we were driving there, and we got to church. And, and I wondered if we'd ever get there. It's just uh, fewer and fewer towns, farther and farther between. Uh, you hit Emporia, and then you run out of trees. And it just... It was a change, and it wasn't too bad for me. I grew up in a small town at the time, Gardner, and, and, uh, but my wife, you know, she, she went to a high school that was bigger than the county of Wichita County, where Leota is, and uh, she couldn't understand all this waving. <laughs> People you don't know just wave down the street, you know, but it only had one stoplight, and, and it wasn't even a stoplight, just flashing red there at the main intersection. And my, what a, what a transition. And, and uh, coming from Johnson County all my life and going out to western Kansas. Of course, I told her when we got married, honey, if you marry me, I will show you the world. So I took her to Leota and brought her back. She's seen the world. It is a difficult thing to leave father and mother. It's a difficult thing to get out of your home and from your kindred in your father's house. Years ago, missionary Terry Hoggard was having a sale of all his personal items in his home there in Valley Center, Kansas. And I watched his television go out, and I watched his furniture go out, and all of his possessions of his home were being taken away in a day. I said, Terry, that's got to be tough. You know what he said to me? He said, Dan... 
It's just things. It's just things. I look at my house and I have determined that we have too many things. Oh, if I could only have the money back that I spent on that exercise bike. I'll make you a good deal. And all the other things, the entrapments of this life, things that we think we have to have. It's a tough thing, but God has spoken. Get thee out from kindred, from your father's house. And by the way, I'm going to send you to land, into a land that you don't know anything about. A land where they don't speak your language. A land that I will show thee. What will he do? Genesis 12 and 4. So Abraham did what? He departed. I'll paraphrase it for you. God said, get up and go. And Abraham got up and went. That's pretty good stuff now. Get up and go. He got up and went. That's called obedience. Faith, to hear the voice of God. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. And then to act upon that faith, not knowing where you're going, looking for a city whose builder and maker is God, and not finding it in your lifetime, but having received the promise, believed it afar off. And so we find him obedient. Abraham departed how? As the Lord had, help me, spoken to him. Dear friends, if God is speaking, obey him. Now be careful here, because I've heard a lot of people say from time to time that God told them this, and God told them that, or God told them the other thing. Be careful never to manipulate with that. When you say God told you something, you'd better be right. Preachers, when you tell them, thus saith the Lord, you better be right. God does speak to man, and he speaks things that always, always, always come to pass. And Abram, formerly an unbeliever, now a believer, hears the voice of God, and he obeys. He departs just as the Lord had spoken to him. So the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 11.8 says it this way. By what? By faith, help me, by faith, Abraham, when he was what? Called. There is such a thing as a call of God, not only for ministry purposes, for missions, for pastoring, for all of these other things, but there's a calling upon the lay person's life as well. You are called to do certain things, and God will continue to call you to do different things at different times in your life, and so don't ignore that call. It's just as important as the divine call to ministry. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance. Well, he lived a long time, but did he really enjoy the fullness of that inheritance? Not in his lifetime. Still looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. It's an inheritance, and what did he do by faith? He obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. Now, I, I'm one of those that I set out on a path to go somewhere. We had to go down on Broadway and 37th Street this week for something. And, and uh, I, I get in the car and I just start going because I know where Broadway is. And I, I can figure out where 37th is. But, but my wife thinks that before I ever pull out of the driveway, I better have it on maps. <laughs> what a waste of time. And only three or four times in my life has it worked out poorly. <laughs> but drove right to 37th and Broadway. Didn't need maps. Just happened to live here all my life and knew how to get there. Until the road construction got in the way and kind of turned us around. God doesn't always tell you the details of how it's going to work. But he's God. So it will work. It will work. If God calls, God will enable. If God calls, God will provide. If God says yes and amen promises, then you can believe it'll surely come to pass just as he has spoken. What's my part? 
My part is to believe God. To have faith in God. How many of you need less faith? No one. How many of you need more faith? All of us. Lord, increase our faith. And when he speaks, obey him. The largest church in the world, Pastor Cho, years ago I heard him speak. And he had an answer to the question, of how did you turn this church into a million people? How did a church grow to a million people? Where if you have to tell your regular people not to come so unsaved people can come. A million people. How, how did you grow your church? Here was his answer. I pray and I obey. <laughs> Grant it, Lord, that we would pray and we would obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. In that song, it talked about the favor of God. The favor of God rests upon us when we obey Him. Guess what happens when we disobey Him? The favor of God, the hand of God can be removed. And just ask Jonah of old how that works out when a fish swallows you. Yeah. It's best to obey. It's best to believe. Pastor, what if I believe and it doesn't happen? Well, number one, God doesn't operate on my timetable. He doesn't operate on your timetable. Uh, God help me and hurry. It doesn't always work. He's never late, seldom early, but he's always on time. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Number two, the life of Abraham is a life of God's favor and covenant promises. Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 through 3, the verses that are between, of course, verse 1 and 4 that we've read. God said to Abraham these promises. And notice the words, I will, I will, I will. God says to him, I will make of thee a great nation. And number two, I will bless thee. I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee. And the conjunction word also means I will. I will curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall how many? All families of the earth be blessed. It is doubtful that the United States of America would even existed were it not for a Jewish banker during the Revolutionary War who funded their war efforts. And God's favor has been upon this nation, one of the greatest nations the world has ever known, next to Israel. We have known the blessing of God because we have stood with Israel through these years. 1948, 1967, 1973, and even today. I've told you several times we were skiing in Colorado one time at Keystone and met a young man there that was from Israel. And we were talking things that were going on in Israel and it was pretty rough at that particular time. And he told me these words. He said, the United States is the only friend we have in the world. And immediately my mind goes to this verse, I will bless those that bless thee. I will curse those that curse thee. And it makes my heart and my mind <laughs> when politicians speak against this nation that God has called, ordained, blessed. They are his chosen people. And it begins with Abraham. Isaac and Jacob. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'll make of thee a great nation, yet Abraham has no children. Abram. I will bless thee. 
Sounds like when you read from chapter 11 of Genesis Tower of Babel and you move to chapter 12, the life of Abraham, it, it seems like that Abram just met God. And yet he believes God and has received the promise of God that God will bless him. I, I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know how tough it is at your place and, and your life and your situation. But I'm telling you that God is a good God and he wants to bless your life. And when the devil tries to steal that blessing and steal that promise from you, don't allow him to do it. Don't give place to the devil. Neither give place to the devil. God has blessing upon blessing upon blessing. And even if your life would be required, the blessing of God rests upon us. Hallelujah. I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hallelujah. Thank God for the future and the hope he has provided to us. I'm going to make your name great after I change it. <laughs> I'm going to make your name great. And you're going to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Genesis 12, 7a, And the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, Unto thy seed, say seed, Unto thy seed will I give this land, this land that I'm promising you. Now, if you read all through the life of Abraham here, chapter 12 through chapter 23, 24, you will find that God repeats this promise over and over and over. Land and seed. Throughout the course of many lifetimes, the devil has made every attempt, and wicked, evil men and nations have made every attempt to take that land that God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if that wasn't bad enough to try to obtain peace, Israel keeps trying to give it away, piece by piece, chunk by chunk. And yet when you read the scripture here and you find out how much land God actually gave them, the size of Israel today is in no way close to the amount of land that God has provided north of Damascus and all the way down to Egypt. I'm telling you, God has made a great promise that they should not be willing to give these away. By the way, every time they've given away land for peace, peace doesn't come. It's disobedient really to God who provides the victory, who wins the battles, the God of battles, that you would continue to give away the land that God has promised. But over and over again, God promised land and seed. And how many tyrants in the world, how many nations of the world have tried to eliminate this nation called Israel to destroy this promise of God? And one day yet to come, we preached on it just last Sunday night, or Sunday night before, that... One day all the kings and all the nations of this world will gather together to drive Israel where? Into the sea. And to fight against our Lord. But God has a promise. I'll give you land and I will give you seed. Genesis 13, 14 through 17. Later on the Lord looks, says to Abraham after Lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward you get it he had to look every direction for all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it to thy seed forever look at it every direction as far as you can see I'm going to give it to you, and I will give it to your seed. How long? Forever. Verse 16. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, you can't even number the dust in my house. <laughs> if you can measure, number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Now, what did he say, first of all? Lift up your eyes, look, see. Now, what does he say? 
not only look and see, this time do some walking. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and on the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Abram, you're about to do a whole lot of walking. A whole lot of walking. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Walk through it. You know, I, I grew up in Pentecost, you know, and people would talk about these uh, Jericho marches. Anybody old enough to remember Jericho marches, you know? And Jonathan and I have talked about this several times. It kind of freaks us out. Uh, we're not really interested in bringing the walls of the church down. So we've decided that uh, Jericho marches probably are best done outside. Um, but um, when we bought this property, we had 4.3 acres at the time, and it was an L-shaped property. There's a farmhouse over here on this corner, and we did not own the corner. Uh, we had paid 92 cents a foot for this 4.38 acres. 92 cents a foot, which was one-fourth the cost of everywhere else. Across the street was all trees and ditch, and it was 238 a foot. And one place over there in Olathe was by the railroad tracks with water all over it, and it was four bucks a foot, and we got ours for 92 cents a foot. I couldn't figure out why the Lord hadn't given us that corner where that farmhouse was. A man had bought it separate from the property, and, and he thought he had a million-dollar piece of three-quarters of an acre, and uh, we weren't going to pay a million dollars. Anyway, a dentist bought it, didn't check with the city, didn't check with zoning, didn't check anything, didn't find out until he'd already paid $100,000 for the corner that uh, it was residential, and he couldn't put a dentist office there. So I tried to sell it to a group that uh, provides care for memory care patients and what have you and, and thought they'd put in a 30-bed hospital on three-quarters of an acre with parking lot. <laughs> and so uh, I had two interns at the time, Daniel Kane and Shauna Inman, and I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to walk around that fence. Their whole internship was about walking around that fence, praying for it. Now, you know... Can't hurt. I didn't care if the walls came tumbling down over there. <laughs> and then this congregation was a part of that too. Because on a given day, after we'd paid off the 4.3 acres in three years, I told them we can build right now. Right now. We were meeting in a school, in a warehouse, back to a school, even one month in a funeral home. We can build right now or we can buy that corner, unanimously buy the corner. Thank God for that decision, it was a great decision. We mow it every week. <laughs> but, northward, southward to the fence, east to Antioch, road, 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 used to be my house. God gave us that property in miraculous fashion. He waited three years for us to pay this part off to give us that piece to pay off. So it sat there interest-free for those years and paid off very quickly. I was kind of ticked. God, we paid 92 cents a foot for this, and we're paying 347 over here. And I felt the Lord impress me. Why don't you average the whole thing? Dollar <laughs> twenty-one. I said, "Okay, Lord." Now I'm not pretending or saying that just because we walked that property and we prayed over that property, well, that helped. I know, but. God is God, and He's in control of everything that's going on in your life right now. Hey, we, we've, had a, we've had an interesting year. And, and certain things going on even today that are, are keeping us on our knees praying, God help in this matter, God help in that thing, in this matter and the other. But God has everything under control. Walk, and I'll give it to you. Number three, 
The life of Abraham is a life of worship. Calling on the name of the Lord, tell your neighbor, you are called to worship. You are called to a life of worship. Not just on Sundays, every day of your life, we are called to be worshipers, and we are told by God himself to call upon the name of the Lord. How did Abram know the favor of God? He did these things. Genesis 12, 8, east of Bethel, he built an altar unto the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Genesis 13, 1 through 4, out of Egypt, Abraham, what was he in verse 2? Rich, rich in cattle, in silver, in gold. He goes to Bethel, the place of the altar that he previously built. There Abram called on the name of the Lord. Verse 18, in Hebron, he built there an altar unto the Lord. He was a worshiper. Tonight, Lord willing, we will preach on the subject, In all thy ways acknowledge him. And that's what this building, the altar, is about. It isn't just about sacrifice. It's about a place of memorial, a place of remembrance, a place where the blessing of God exists, where the promise of God is given. And so he builds an altar of remembrance there, not just for him, but for future generations to see that God has laid claim on this spot, this promised land. And God will be faithful to keep his promises. So to future generations, be a worshiper. How many of you know the Father seeks such to worship him? That worship him in spirit and in truth. Can you have too much faith? No, you cannot. Can you worship too much? No, you cannot. Build an altar and call upon the name of the Lord. Why? Because when you call, God answers. Every Sunday we meet, Jeremiah 33 is opened in this Bible. Call unto me and I will answer thee and I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. How many of you know he is the God of answered prayer? So pray more and worry less. Number four. A life in the favor of God is a life of transformation. I mentioned earlier that Abram, from the land of Ur of the Chaldees, Babylon, right up against the Euphrates River, was polytheistic. His dad was an idolater, worshipped many gods. This man, Abram, has changed from polytheistic to monotheistic, one God, one true God. He is taken from Ur in the land of Chaldees, goes to Haram, way north and a little bit west. He goes to Canaan, to Egypt, back to Canaan, up to Damascus to rescue Lot. <laughs> Mount Moriah to willingly offer his son on an altar of sacrifice. From Moriah to Gerar and eventually to Beersheba. Here he goes. He's traveling River Euphrates, clear up here, Haram, clear down here, Shechem, Bethel down to Egypt, back to Bethel. And all the while, he's being transformed by God. How many of you are thankful that your life has been transformed by God? In this final point of our message today, Abram is transformed from a coward to courageous. Later on in Genesis, he will be transformed by name from Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah. And he will be transformed from fatherless to the father of nations. Transformation. Let's find the coward part. Genesis 12, 17 through 20, this is the fifth step on the journey of, nation, of cities that I've told you about. The Bible says in verse 17 that the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. For Pharaoh called Abraham and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? 
Why didst thou not tell me that she is thy wife? Abraham told Sarah to lie and say, I'm his sister. Well, there's a family connection there, but it's still a lie. Why did you lie to me? Why didn't you tell me she was... Now notice that Abram was the liar and Pharaoh got the plagues. Why'd you say she's my sister? I might have taken her to be my wife. Now therefore, behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. You know, it'd be bad enough if that's the only time that Abram had pulled that trick. But he tries it again later. He's afraid he's going to die. Pharaoh would take Sarah's wife and, well... This is what happens when we, we, we try to work things out on our own. A continual problem in the life of Abraham. Sarah says, take Hagar. Maybe that's the way God intends for you to have seed and generate. How'd that work out? How's that still working out today? Always trying to do it on our own. Just, just, I hear this. Just stretch the truth a little and tell him you're my sister. Coward. Coward. But as he progresses through this favor of God, a favored life, we find him in Genesis chapter 14 when five kings and four kings go to war. And Sodom is taken where Lot lives, and Lot is taken. Genesis 14, 13, when Abram heard that his brother, his relative, was taken captive, he armed his trained servants born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. He divided himself against them, he and his servants by night, and he smote them. He defeated them. He's not a nation yet. He just has servants that are good with livestock. But he takes 318. And hearing the news of Lot being taken captive, he immediately is courageous and goes to get him. Wow. Wow. He smote them, defeated them, he pursued them unto Hobach, which was on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. This Abram is a favored man. He's received the promise of God for land and seed and now transformed by God, he goes and pursues and rescues Lot and everything he had. And by the way, when Abram left Egypt, he left with some of their wealth. And when we went up there to Damascus to get Lot, he took their wealth too. Oh, man. Now, I know that most of us are not rich. But, man, I got two cars. I got a roof over my house. I got more battery-operated cars and trucks in my garage than you can count. We have to throw clothes away from time to time because our closet isn't big enough to hold them all. Or we lose a lot of weight and they don't fit. I had steak twice this week. Cut one in half, had four ounces of that meal and four ounces of that meal. Filled me up real well. Gained a pound. Hmm. Troubles? Yeah, we got troubles. Problems? Some of them pretty big. 
there's something called the favor of God. And it rests upon you. It's a covering that God has said, he's mine, she's mine, I bless them, I will keep them, I will help them, I will not leave them, I will not forsake them, I will not allow the devil to have his way, I will not bring harm into their life, I will bring faith into their life, and they will obey me, and I will bless them. Tell your neighbor right now, you belong to God. You belong to God. I know the Lord will make a way 